Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I'm Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Paul Castle, who serves as Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts at Northern Illinois University. Paul, welcome to the show. Delighted to be here, Aaron. Great to see you. So, well, I'm so excited to be able to talk with you. Obviously, there's some really important work that you're doing uh, at Northern Illinois. Um, but what I thought we, if we could do is, especially your work that you're doing with kind of if the almost what I would refer to as the arts ecosystem of the city, and especially with the goal of being able to have all of the things that you have to offer as an institution, be able to provide access or to be able to reach underrepresented communities. Um, and so I know you do that through a number of different partnerships, but wondering if we could kind of talk about that. So maybe I would just start first off kind of is there an ethos that that you kind of have in terms of from your leadership that is driving this or an ethos that is part of the school? Yes, we have uh, four vision points. Like those are the kind of things that deans are expected to produce. And um, one, the most central one is arts for everyone and everyone for the arts. And what's really, uh, I think, interesting and what I love about NIU is we serve a very diverse population. 75% of our students are first generation and from underrepresented populations. The same isn't quite true of the College of Visual and Performing Arts, but we see that growing and work and we need to we need to work across the ecosystem to ensure access and opportunity for our students. And we've done a lot of great work. Um, in particular, I can point out the work we've been done with Ingenuity in Chicago. And Ingenuity is this amazing organization that takes teaching artists and places them in schools where there are a, there's a paucity, a dearth of art instruction. And it's a great way to use working artists to supplement their income, also develop their craft, and then give back to their communities. Often these artists are embedded in the communities within the school districts. And um, it's a great organization. And the executive director is a Husky, Nicole Upton. Uh, she is a, one of our own, a theater uh, graduate from some years ago. She's terrific. And when I first joined in 2016, I got involved with Ingenuity right away in developing pipelines between our teacher preparation in music and art ed, but also our, our working artists, our many, many alums who are in the city who are already doing a lot of that kind of work. That is absolutely awesome. And when you kind of form these types of partnerships, so there's so many in our audience who, you know, either have existing partnerships or want to create them. Do you mm -hmm. kind of try to, to follow any, uh, you know, either best practices or kind of just core principles that you look at partnerships? I find that sometimes organizations get involved in partnerships and then it takes five or 10 years to realize maybe this isn't working or delivering. Wondering, do you have a kind of any metrics or systems or, or uh, principles that you try to follow with partnerships? Absolutely. The first and foremost is service. We have to serve the communities that we're, we're approaching. We don't want to just swan in like, well, we've got great talent and we want to, we have to partner with them, listen carefully to what are the needs on the ground for the, the various constituents or the, the, organization, the organizations we partner with. So with Ingenuity, we're looking at, here's a great example. Um, we're, so uh, Ingenuity supports Chicago public schools. Um, the new director of art education, um, Cesar, uh, they need like 60 dance teachers, but there is only one in one university in the in the state that does teacher licensure and endorsements for dance education. So we're partnering with Ingenuity and our students and our dance program is one of the most diverse programs we have, but it isn't a teacher prep program. So we uh, we connect with Loyola University to create to bring our students into Loyola who get the credential to go into Chicago public schools to teach students who really, really want to have some dance experience. And those students will often then what we hope is come back to NIU, develop their artistry and then go back to the community. So that's a great example of what is the need? 
how do we best serve this? And what are the partnerships that we can exploit and use and utilize? Because we're all in this together, as you well know. And the days where we're fighting for you know our own turf, that's long gone. And it's not a, a sustainable way to work. So yeah. those are some of the principles that we do. Absolutely. No. And I love that. And of course, love that approach and also love the full circle, which is oftentimes how collaborations end up working the best. Um, and especially that, you know, uh, that that mindset that, you know, these days we hope is more present of kind of, you know, getting away from silly issues of turf and, and realizing that truly a rising tide lifts, you know, uh, all ships. Yeah, you'd think that that would be uh, so obvious, but it, it's, uh, you know, I think part of it's entrenchment. Some of it's our own fault as artists. We're very, we care deeply about our territory and our area, and we don't see that, you know, we think we have to hold on rather than this gesture where we have to open. That, I think, is a much more powerful uh, way to approach things. I've got another good example that uh, about listening and, and serving the community. So there's the second biggest school district in the state is Elgin. Elgin's a, a little west and north of Chicago. It has a very large Hispanic and Latinx population, and they happen to be very interested in mariachi and banda. It just so happens our trumpet uh, professor has his own banda, and he developed a, mar a mariachi band here on campus, and it has transformed uh, our um, our relationship with Elgin, uh, the Elgin School District, and we're very excited about offering partnerships. Be a student literally came to a, a accepted students' day recently, heard the band, and went, "I never thought I would hear my own culture represented at at a at a university." And here they were playing the music that I grew up with and loved, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to be doing. And it it means opening our practices up beyond the traditional borders. Matthew. I love that um, book, La Frontera, I believe it is, that talks about border, the borderlines. That, that to me really opened my mind about how to think uh, more proactively about engaging with community. That is so, so that's such a great example. It's so critically important. Um, and also, of course, finding either the methods and or the, the uh, topics, issues, et cetera, that are so close to students and where students then feel themselves in what they're learning and, and how they're connecting. And maybe even kind of just following that through a little deeper, talking about school districts and say, for example, even Chicago public schools, um, both kind of what's the breadth of the partnerships you're doing. So many in our audience are at institutions that are either partnering with schools or are from, uh, within school districts, partnering mm -hmm. with universities. Um, and again, similarly, as you look at partnerships with the schools, do you have a specific goal and or top priorities in mind as you're doing that work? Well, each of the schools, so we have new directors in two of our three schools and, and one director just got uh, reappointed. And so I did a tour around Northern Illinois, starting in Chicago, moving to DeKalb, going to Rockford with these three directors to listen to these communities and see what are the opportunities for partnerships, both with the artistic professional community and the K through 12 uh, community, and of course, donors and philanthropists and, and things like that. So um, let me gather my thoughts to 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 circle back on this. Sure. Um, no, absolutely. Yeah. And as you kind of, yeah, no, as you think about those, and I also love also too, and kind of the, the whole aspect of listening as it relates to partnerships, but with those, you know, partnerships and just thinking any in our audience who are also thinking of partnering with schools. Right. So here's, the, I just remembered the example I was going to give. Um, the tech, the technical theater and design theater is overwhelmingly white and male. This is a pretty known, we all know it. So we are being very intentional with Chicago Public Schools about identifying students who are interested in that, going and recruiting them and creating what we believe will be a very powerful program. Uh, it's a little complicated math, but essentially a one plus three plus three. So one year of college and high school in which you deal with primarily the general education courses, then a BA in design tech theater, which would which leads to preferential admissions to our MFA program in design tech, which then feeds back into the professional community. And we think that's both 
um, donor attractive. It serves a very specific need and gives students access and opportunity that they haven't had before. And so we that's the kind of virtuous circle that we're really interested in. That is just at the nascent stage, but we're very excited about that uh, possibility. And our new director of school and theater dance, Roxana Connor, is leading that effort because of her deep ties with Chicago community. Uh, so I love that. And again, kind of just the strategy of thinking, what are all of the factors? Where are all of our constituents in this? Um, but ultimately, the idea of how are we going to have young people prepared to be in the industry, to be in the field? That is so key and such a driving point. Um, and kind of another thing is you kind of see this and you're looking at the landscape and the ecosystem interacting really with a city overall. Are there any trends that you see either coming or that you're thinking, you know, we really need to be preparing for this or focusing or thinking on this, or this is a key threat or risk, just anything as you're thinking kind of future forward looking? I think that post George Floyd, post pandemic, we're all looking at our pedagogy and the traditions that perhaps no longer serve and are not welcoming and don't allow for the intent, the feeling of belonging that I think is absolutely essential for anyone to thrive in, in the world, let alone an art ecosystem. It's tough enough being an artist as it is. So I think we really have to pay attention and not just put our statements out about diversity, equity, and belonging, but making sure it's embedded in curriculum. And then along with that, training our faculty, because the fact is they haven't been trained in that in those ideas. And so one of the things we just did, I'm very happy, it's public news, Roosevelt Griffin is our new jazz, uh, head of jazz program. He's also going to be the first uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator of the college. And it'll be his job to partner across the college to help train faculty in both pedagogy, but also in searches to diversify our faculty as well and our staff. And, and to work, uh, coordinate all the activities of the college so that um, we're working together, not across purposes or or with, with sufficient information and education and training, because that's where I think, we're, especially in the arts, uh, uh, we're not necessarily trained as teachers, and we're certainly not trained in the psychological, social, emotional well-being of our students. And again, we're, we're passing on our knowledge, but we need to expand our understanding of what that means. Music theory is a great example, as you well know, that we have to challenge. Um, I'm a theater graduate myself, so I like Artaud's call, no more masterpieces. And in the same way, we have to be, we can't be precious about those things. I say a lot, you know, Shakespeare, maybe Shakespeare's day is maybe not over, but is changing and that's okay. Shakespeare's gonna be okay. But we need to we we have to open the canon, and this is a long conversation we've been having for too long. But now people need to be really addressing it, because Absolutely. if we don't, we're going to lose a generation. Absolutely, no, definitely, and it's so great kind of seeing both these exciting issues, but also how you are you know in that process of looking and saying, look, this is the reality that all of our students are going to be in. How are we best preparing them? Uh, for that, which I think is fantastic. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask of all of my guests, you know, you're in the midst of all of this work and obviously it is so exciting. You can see that excitement, it's visceral in you, but there has to be some tough days, days of challenge. And just wondering in those days as a leader and especially as an administrative leader, are there any methods or or uh, uh, kind of mechanisms that you use uh, to be able to overcome those challenges? Well, I think self-care is essential. You have to take care of yourself. So even yesterday, I needed a, a sort of a timeout and I need to take a walk and clear my mind because I can't afford to have a bad day. And I and, and, I, and I have a responsibility to the people who report to me and the people who want to whom I'm responsible, students, faculty, staff, to make sure that I'm doing absolutely my best. And part of that is taking care of myself. And then, and the second thing is is to keep my eyes on the long game. Uh, and that's sometimes hard. It's so easy to get lost in the weeds, the budget situations that everybody the enrollment cliff. I mean, whatever the day, you know, the flavor of the day of what doom is coming. But keeping my eyes on that, and that's what keeps me going, knowing that the service that we're providing is really essential and and important, at least it is to me. And um, that gets me through the tough times. And then um, 
good partners and and supportive uh, spouses and and um, and the and the student work. I think that always grounds me to go and see a show and exhibit, hear a concert, and go, yeah, we're doing something good. Paul Castle, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for everything you do, and thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Aaron, so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.